what the heck should we eat? There are few questions more confusing than this in the modern world. Vegan, keto, paleo, pescatarian, vegetarian, carnivore, and the list goes on. Popular dietary gurus weave confusing tapestries of half-truths and contradictions that thinly veil monetary interests and biases. It's official. We are the losers of the diet wars. Should we even care about what we eat? Does God even care about what we eat? This episode of Physically Spiritual will explore eating. Welcome to Physically Spiritual. I've been amazed by how much growing physically healthier has changed my spiritual life. I am captivated with discovering the truth about my body and how it relates to my relationship with God. Physically Spiritual is my attempt to harmonize and share what I've discovered. I'm your host, Andrew Reinhardt. Welcome back to Physically Spiritual, everyone. As we get started, let me share our opportunities. If you want to support everything we do at Awaken Catholic, consider becoming a part of the Awaken Nation. The Awaken Nation is a community of patrons that support Awaken Catholic monetarily. For as little as a cup of coffee a month, you get access to some bonus content and the satisfaction of knowing you're making all this happen for the kingdom. The best experience of everything we publish at Awaken Catholic is on the Awaken app. Go to the Awaken app. .io or search for the Awaken app on your app store on your phone. On the, the app is our great discussion boards. It's like an alternate to social media. You can get access to your premium content if you're on the nation and also discussion boards with the show hosts. So get the Awaken app. We are also partners with another app, the Hollow app. The Hollow app is a Catholic meditation app to help you find peace and grow in your spiritual journey. It has guided meditations, a course on learning how to pray, sleep studies or sleep stories, sorry, and a whole lot more. So get the Hollow app with our member link at hollow.app forward slash awaken. And if you want to get access to anything I'm putting out there, go to becominggift.com. Or if you want help applying any of the ideas from the show, go to becominggift.com forward slash coach to find my coaching and spiritual direction practice. As I mentioned in the intro, there's a little more confusing in our world than what we should eat. And in this episode, I'm continuing the series on asceticism. Remember, asceticism is is mortifying our flesh, uh, intentionally picking something up or or denying ourselves something that's difficult in order to to heal the faculties of our soul, of our soul, to uh, to help us be more attracted to what's truly good for us and more repulsed by what's truly bad for us. Um, so one of the most common ways we do this is by what we eat, right? As as Catholics during the season of Lent, we're all invited to an ab- abstinence practice on Fridays to abstain from meat. So we're intentionally choosing what we're eating, giving something up in order to grow and to change. Um, So as I start this topic, I want to share a little bit from my story. Uh, If you've followed along with every episode of Physically Spiritual, you've heard me talk some about weight loss and how getting healthier has um, really revolutionized my spiritual life. And that was the genesis of this show, what inspired me to, to share these ideas. Uh, but my weight had always fluctuated in my life. I was a big kid. I crossed over the 200 pound mark when I was in seventh grade. You know, so that's a pretty big seventh grader. And then throughout high school, I was a football player and I was a wrestler. Um, and I played football bigger than I wrestled. Now, I never did like the crazy cutting weight that a lot of wrestlers are famous for, but my weight would swing 40 pounds up and down between seasons. Um, you know, still over 200 pounds, but but shifting back and forth. Getting into college, what happened is I I stopped focusing on exercise as much, focusing more on my studies, still exercise some, and my weight would fluctuate. I would just continue to shift, you know, that 40, 50 pounds up and down, up and down. And this all came to a head because I had multiple knee surgeries, uh, just different injuries from playing sports uh, when I wasn't really uh, practicing much, just going out and trying to be a weekend warrior on the field. And um, it, it ended up having uh, four knee surgeries. 
And when I was in my first job, I had tried a, a diet, a fad diet called the HCG diet. The idea was um, probably not very well founded by science. HCG is a hormone that the female body releases. And the thing about a woman in pregnancy is the, um, the, the, the woman's body doesn't allow the baby to starve. So the, the hormones in the woman's body basically allow for, for fat to be used more readily the theory goes. And one of these hormones is HCG. So the idea is that you take HCG and it sort of tricks your body into this point. And then when you don't eat, your body is able to access more body fat, but it's essentially, um, kind of a starvation diet that you pay somebody, uh, for these uh, hormone droppers. So I, I had lost 30 pounds doing this diet, right? Another swing down and then, um, had my fourth knee surgery. And after that, you know, couldn't, couldn't exercise. Um, I gained 150 pounds. Uh, so now I'm up into the high three hundreds, almost 400 pound kind of range. Um, and, and, and it was a shock to me because once you get so big scale, stop giving a number. I, um, my scale at home, I had no idea how much I weighed because it just said, you know, air or, or whatever it said. So I was at somebody else's house, um, on Christmas Eve of 20 or New Year's of 2016, stepped on the scale and it said 372. Um, there's probably times when I was higher than that and lower than that, but that was a shocker, right? That's big. You know, I, I, um, it kind of flashed before my eyes that I might not live into my fifties or sixties. Um, you know, so I, I started that first, that first year of my transition into getting healthier, I kind of followed the, the, the standard advice wisdom, which is eat less and exercise more. They kind of treat the, the weight problem as an energy balance problem, right? You eat more than you burn, your body stores it. If you burn more than you eat, then your body uses it. Um, and it worked. I lost 40 pounds, but at the end of that year, I gained weight back. I gained over 10 pounds back. The next year I, I tried kind of a fancier eat less move more approach. It's a, a very popular, um, dietary approach, probably the most popular dietary thing that's out there. And I won't name the name, but that year I'd lost 60 pounds and then I gained, started gaining it back, even though I was tracking on my app, all the points and, and everything else and all the exercise and, you know, wearing the Fitbit, I was doing the whole nine yards. I was still started to gain weight back. Well, the third year of my weight loss, I had gone in and met with my doctor and he started writing on his a prescription pad, like what to eat, what not to eat. And he was essentially recommending like a low carb, whole food approach to diet. You know, some people would call this a keto diet or a ketogenic diet because by eating fat and not carbs, your body uses these things called ketones for energy is the idea. Um, but the, he really emphasized food quality over, um, you know, just making sure there was uh, fat in your body to, for it to burn. That over the next year, I lost over 110 more pounds and I didn't gain any weight back. So in total, I lost somewhere in the ballpark of 175 pounds. And then for the last three and a half years, right, 17, 18, well, I guess two and a half years, it's been the longest stretch of my life where my body weight has been within a 10% range. So the ups and downs haven't moved more than 10% from that original point where I got down to, which is kind of a miracle for me because my whole, my whole adult life from the time I had a quote unquote adult size body on, I was having these annual weight swings. Um, so this is some of my, um, journey about food. And, and, and as I'm talking, you're probably identifying, you know, different dietary patterns, different things. Um, but in the context of these, uh, presentations on asceticism. Remember the different foundational principles I wanted to use. So you can go back to the episode introducing asceticism or the previous episodes on solitude and on friendship or relationships. And we talk about having a Catholic worldview, meaning we're going to be informed by both faith and reason. What can we discover from science? And then what can we also discover um, from revelation? And then with that too, we need to do all of this in the context of our story, right? The way you should eat should be answered in the context of, of what's in your best interest. What's in your best interest, you know, where are you now and where do you think you ought to be? And is that in line with what 
God's vision for your life is. So maybe your struggle is having too much body weight, right? Well, maybe then the goal is to lose weight. Maybe your struggle is not having enough body weight and your goal is to gain weight. Maybe um, you are having other health issues you think are food related. Well, depending on how you answer these questions, then that should determine the dietary pattern and the way that you start to, um, to, to mortify your desires for food. And, and then also your story from your past, right? So, so what has happened leading up to this point should inform your decisions on how you eat, right? Well, maybe you have uh, struggles with eating disorder or something in your past. Well, well, that should affect your decision today. You know, that the next talk on asceticism is going to be about fasting. Probably not a good idea if you struggled with, with these things before. Uh, other things that might be in your history, like, like part of the reason why my doctor recommended the dietary pattern he did is because he tested my blood sugar, my insulin, and it was clear that part of my, my weight loss, the problem why I was gaining weight, was my blood sugar was out of control. And my body was creating more insulin and there was insulin resistance. So this is, could be like a pre-diabetes or metabolic syndrome. So the idea was you, you get rid of the carbohydrates, the dietary sugar, then you lower the blood sugar, you reduce the body's need for insulin, and then the body can start to lose weight. Now, another person may have gained weight for a completely different reason. Although this kind of metabolic syndrome pattern I think is pretty common, um, you, you might have uh, extra weight for uh, psychological reasons, or there may be a whole complex web or, or a, a complex um, web of causes to why you've gained weight. So all of this needs to be teased out when you're answering this question, how should I eat? So let's dig in and talk about food from a natural perspective. Uh, as I get started, uh, this is just going to be a skim of the surface. I'm uh, working on writing a, a whole course about food um, from a Catholic perspective, from a Catholic worldview. So hopefully that'll be released sometime in the next year if I get the time. <laughs> uh, so this is, is more or less like a little, uh, almost like a teaser for that because each um, subtopic of this episode is going to be multiple sessions in that course. So first, what's food? What is food? At base, food is just sunlight, dirt, and air put together in different ways. Sunlight, dirt, and air put together in different ways. The, the basis of the food chain are, are plants, different kinds of plant life, whether it be uh, aquatic or it be on, on land. But essentially, all a plant does is it, it takes roots, it draws nutrients up out of the soil, mostly minerals, up out of the soil, and then it absorbs sunlight and photosynthesis. And then it, it takes carbon out of the air, right? It, it takes carbon and then releases oxygen. This is why people use plants to reduce, um, to reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that's all a plant is, is nature putting together energy from the sun, carbon from the air, and nutrients from the soil, minerals from the soil. And then some of our food, which comes from animals, right? They eat the plants and digest it and then make animal out of it. Uh, and, but that the basis is just sunlight, soil, and air. I want to give a shout out to another show here on El, or on Awaken Catholic Elevate Ordinary. Had a recent episode where they talked about soil, and um, I think it was uh, the the um, on the thumbnail is something about theology of the body and the earth. So take that, uh, go listen to that for a little more about dirt and food. So that's all food is, sunlight, dirt, and air. Interestingly enough, when God creates humanity in the book of Genesis, what does he do? But he forms us out of the dirt of the ground and then breathes um, ruah, the breath of God, into us. So dirt and air. Uh, so why do we eat? Why do we want to eat this stuff? It gives us Food gives us energy. And food also gives us the building blocks of our body, right? It gives us all of the stuff we need to make ourselves, or most of it at least. You know, our body's not interested in food for the same reasons we are. A lot of people, um, they think about food from the perspective of looks. I think it's, it's really kind of uh, endemic in our culture that we, um, we just think about, when we think about food and we think about diet and we think about eating, we're concerned about our body image, 
So a lot of people are making their dietary choices because they want to accomplish a certain look. Well, I got news for you. Your body doesn't care how you look. (laughs) Your body wants to survive. Your body wants to survive. So, So the attractions you experience and the repulsions you experience to food is, is your body reacting to the environment in such a way to prime it for survival? Um, but as as creatures that reproduce by begetting offspring, by by re- reproduction, um, there's there's a an adaptation pressure toward our younger years of life, meaning meaning that the attractions and repulsions of your body are interested in bringing you to the point of childbearing. And carrying you through that age, but after that, it's not those, those feelings aren't really uh, in your best interest. <laughs> so, if you want to live to be 80, 90, 100 years old, the instincts you have around food in your 20s probably aren't going to set you up for success. In fact, what you find is when people just eat whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, they typically are pretty healthy until they're 15, 20, 25, 30. Those that are really lucky, maybe when they're 40, but then typically what happens is if they if they put no direction or or no order, no structure on on their eating, uh, people tend to become metabolically um, unhealthy at that point. They'll start gaining weight, or or maybe even more dangerous is they don't start gaining weight, and what's happening is the fat is forming around their uh, organs and not under their skin. Um, So your body isn't too interested in getting you into your 90s. Your body is interested in priming you to the point of reproduction, to those prime years of reproduction. Um, So these these instincts that we experience, these attractions and repulsions, need to be directed. So there are some things that we're attracted to. Uh, Some things are called essential nutrients. Essential nutrients. They're essential because our body does not have I'm going to use a fancy word, endogenous ways to create that nutrient. It just means that there's, there isn't anything in the body that it can make it if you don't put it in. So there are some things we get from food that we won't get unless we eat it. There are other things that if we don't eat it, our body has other ways to make it. For example, one of the vitamins, which is kind of a hormone too, is vitamin D. This is one of the probably the most famous ones. So we can eat things that have vitamin D, but we also get vitamin D through our skin from the sun, right? So you can go outside, sit in the sun and get vitamin D, or you can eat your vitamin D. Another example are things like carbohydrates, right? The the dietary pattern I took worked because our body is capable of something called gluconeogenesis. Our body needs glucose. It needs sugar. But if we don't have sugar in our diet, our body makes sugar, meaning our, our body makes glucose out of different things because especially the brain needs some glucose to work. Um, so our body has an endogenous way, a built-in way to get this even if we don't eat it. There are other things that we need to eat, meaning if we don't eat them, our body won't have enough of it. Uh, you might have heard of essential uh, amino acids, so amino acid, just a word for protein or essential fatty acids, meaning essential fat. So uh, what we might infer from the fact that some of these nutrients are essential and others aren't, we might think of um, we might think of the conditions that made the human body be what it is, right? The, the pressures on the human body throughout time that caused adaptations. So the various things that our body can make, even if we don't eat them, we might infer that that was a beneficial quality to our ancestors. So those genes were selected through the process of of natural selection, right? So so there were likely periods of time in the history of our ancestors when carbohydrates were not available in abundance for their diet, not in the quality and the amount that the body needed. So, So it became a beneficial quality if our body was able to produce its own sugar, our own, its own glucose. Um, but then those things that our body doesn't have a way to create on its own, we might infer from that, that in the history of what made our human body what it is, that there wasn't an extended period of time when those nutrients weren't available. So if, 
if we're in a, a, a place in modern society where those nutrients aren't available in abundance or in the amount that the body needs, then what that implies is that our, our modern food environment is unnatural. It doesn't match the conditions uh, that we evolved in, that we adapted in. So I might point out um, some of these being things like iodine, or there's a lot of talk today about omega-3 fatty acids, right? that we're not getting enough of these things in our diet, and then we supplement them or sometimes even fortify foods that they don't naturally come in because we know people need more of them. If you think of the whole period of time that scientists believe brought the human body to be what it is, and whether or not you believe in the theory of evolution is kind of secondary, because we're not asking the question, what happened? We're asking the question, how should I eat? Now, uh, since the if you so if you took the, the whole history of human food and laid it out, let's say for scale it were a football field. Well, of that football field, the history of humanity where we had agriculture, meaning we domesticated animals and started growing plants, and that made up a significant portion of the American diet or of the human diet, would be about the last inch of that football field the last inch of that football field. Um, so this is important because this, these 99 yards and however many feet, except for that last inch, right? These are all of the, the pressures that cause the different adaptation of the human body. And in this last inch through technology, what we've done is we've rapidly changed our environment at a speed at which our body cannot keep up. So there, there's been, I think, partial adaptations to some of the, um, some of these, um, these changes in our environment. For example, scientists have discovered um, different people are, are more or less adapted for dairy, right? There's different enzymes, different uh, things with genetics that, that have been identified where some people seem to have less issues eating dairy and, and are able to utilize the nutrients more. And then there's a, a, a smaller group of the population that has, doesn't have that adaptation. So we might say we have a partial adaptation to some of these foods. So let's talk a little bit more about this history. Uh, some people will name what's called an agricultural revolution. Depending on where you are and were in the world um, would depend on when the onset of this was. I talked about this a little bit um, in the episode about the Eucharist a few episodes ago. Um, so this agricultural revolution was just a, a time when people started to domesticate animals, started to plant crops, especially on the floodplains of these rivers, uh, most famously being like the Nile and the Tigris and Euphrates. And the floodplains were important because the soil was renewed by the flood and the bringing on of different minerals and silt and things from the flooding. Other places where agriculture was tried, the soil would be depleted because of the concentration of crops. And, and in modern times, we overcome this by the, the application of various synthetic chemicals in most places, or some people employing uh, regenerative practices will overcome the depletion of soil by rotating crops and uh, integrating pastured animals onto the soil. Um, so in this agricultural revolution, we have uh, people moving out of hunter-gatherer lifestyles into cities, and, and with that, um, Actually, we believe a, a greater reduction in the diversity of the human diet. You know, some of the arguments that people will make, make toward more extreme dietary styles like veganism or a carnivore diet where people just eat animal products is they'll look at various qualities of the human diet and say, well, look at the human teeth. It's obvious we have like these molars to chew up plants or like look at this thing about the human stomach and it's obvious that we're designed you know, to absorb food from animals because it's more bioavailable. Um, you know, I think if you look at the human body, uh, we have really good evidence that our ancestors pretty much ate everything. Like depending where they were in the world, what was available. But part of what made the human species so hardy was the fact that we could eat anything. We could eat all kinds of plants. We could eat all kinds of animals, you know, short of being like ruminants where we could eat grass or something like that. Um, but the, the human body can survive under a massive variety of conditions. And it's clear that our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have ate a ton 
of different things, depending on what was in season, what they could find, what they could kill, um, and then having to, to move sometimes from place to place. So there was a lot of variety in their diet. And one of the main things that happened when people started agriculture was the, the human diet started to get pared down and, and focused on specific things, specific animals that could get domesticated or specific plants that could be planted. Uh, at the at the same time, um, uh, it, it was really important that this agricultural revolution happened. You know, we shouldn't look back and over-romanticize the hunter-gatherer days. You know, people, they didn't have long lives. They died of all sorts of things. It, it, you know, the, they whether it be killed by an animal or, or by a flood or by a famine, um, the hardship of life. Um, but whatever the condition was, I'm not uh, romanticizing this more ancient lifestyle. I'm just saying the conditions that brought the human body ab about and, and therefore, the conditions by which the human body flourishes uh, were determined by what people encountered over this long stretch of history prior to agricultural technology. Well, fast forward uh, thousands of years. and the last hundred years, we went through kind of another food revolution. You might call it an industrial food revolution, especially uh, around the time of the Second World War and the need to create rations for large numbers of people. Um, and, and then the, the application of different methods and models discovered around the agricultural or around the industrial revolution to the food supply, whether it be the mechanization of farm equipment or um, the production of food in um, factory environments, there was an even, I would say, more significant transition in the human diet. We started to treat the human diet like a chemistry experiment, right? And this is what led to the modern food label. The modern food label kind of treats food from a, a very reductionistic perspective. You know, this, this, I have an apple here. Um, an apple, you might say is, well, what is it? Well, it's calories. What, what are calories? But a measurement of energy. And it's, uh, and those calories come from fat, protein and carbohydrates sometimes called the macronutrients right so your your body can turn fat into ketones and run on that or it can turn carbs into glucose or sugar and run on that uh, then your body has protein and that protein could be used for energy although it's less efficient so it's unlikely to do that unless it has to but that protein is used as building blocks for things like muscles you, the fatty acids are also used to create, for example, cell membranes. And that's what all of that fat is doing in your blood, is, develop, is delivering substrate to make cell membranes and other things. Um, so we started talking about our food and our bodies like we would talk about a chemistry experiment. So the way that farming was done was that the soil is sort of perceived as, as a holder that, that you put the crop in, and then all the things that the plant needs, you apply to the soil uh, through different forms of chemicals that you put on it. And then uh, you harvest the food with a piece of machinery, and it goes off to a factory, where then it's rearranged in various ways. Right. So we have these commodity crops, we call them, primarily wheat, corn, and soy. And then scientists have discovered how to manipulate these things in various ways to create um, these food-like substances that the majority of people today live on. Right? And this is what, what forms what's sometimes called the standard American diet or the, the acronym SAD, the SAD diet. Uh, so go to your grocery store and look at the different food labels. And what you'll see is that most food is a rearrangement of these three um, commodity crops uh, in, the added, in the addition of different dyes and other chemicals to fortify them and to preserve them. Um, and, and people live on this stuff. I saw an interesting chart once where the, 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 the so the beautiful thing about this um, industrial revolution of food is the abundance of food we have. So we have this abundance of food, which is good. It's good that people hopefully in the, our contemporary world aren't starving or there's no reason for them to. There's plenty of food to go around. Typically where, where people are encountering starvation, there's political things going on uh, where it's not available to them. So we have this overabundance of food, which is a good thing. And there's never been a period of time in history where so much food was available and we were so resilient from the possibility of famine and other natural disasters. So praise God for that. But on, on the flip side, there's also an accumulating evidence that our 
our diet is leading to um, uh, some, what we might say is an excess of energy with a poverty of nutrients. <laughs> so there's a there's a, a phenomenon in our world where actually the people who are poorest in our society have the highest rate of obesity. And people experience this hunger in spite of uh, energy excess. right? So people will eat and eat and eat and eat, uh, but they won't get hungry. They won't get satisfied. right? And I think one of the reasons for this is n- nutrient deficiency. Um, so one of the, the ideas I want to talk about later is this idea of nutrient density, thinking about food from the perspective of nutrient density. But the reality is that that f- our food and our diet isn't a chemistry experiment, right? Our body's not a lab, um, but there's something about this apple that's, I think, even beyond the capacity of modern science to understand. There's a complexity to a natural food um, that transcends our capacity to reduce it to a bunch of numbers. Um, some functional medicine doctors have started to use the adage that food is information. Food is information. So while it's true that we do need energy and we do need protein and and we need fatty acids, we need these building blocks of our body and fuel to move. Um, Food is also information for our our body. So there's a a fancy term I want to throw out there called, um, it's called uh, phytonutrient (laughs) co-adaptation. Phytonutrient co-adaptation. So a phytonutrient are all these things that have been discovered in these foods um, that are more than just the energy and nutrients, but there's actually things in these foods which change things in our body other than just energy in size, in building. So eating certain foods can change my epigenetic expression. We talk about uh, epigenetics in Every Cell Remembers in season one of a Physically Spiritual, but we have our genetic code, and then, then those genes all either express themselves or don't express themselves. Some of it's hardwired, right? And that's sort of what we've inherited. But then there's a part of that genetic code that's affected by epigenetics, a layer on top of the genes that determine whether or not that gene expresses itself. So our food can cause epigenetic changes. Our food also affects the colony of microorganisms in our stomach. Another episode from season one um, being um, your body as a garden. I start talking about the microbiome. Uh, so you, you might actually think of your digestive tract as being outside of your body. From, from your skin, down your throat, your stomach, and out where uh, the waste goes out is actually a continuous surface. So some people have started to conceive of the dietary tract in your body as outside of you. And then this whole surface, your skin, through your whole digestive tract and out the other side is full of colonies of microorganisms, bacteria, virus, fungi, uh, and other little teeny creatures. Some scientists think that these little creatures in your body outnumber your quote unquote cells that belong to you. Um, So everything you eat is also affecting this colony of microorganisms, right? And these microorganisms get involved in all sorts of processes in the body. Like a lot of the Um, A lot of the, some of the uh, neurochemicals that affect your mood are primarily produced in your stomach by these microorganisms. So there's a direct connection through your vagus nerve between your stomach and what's in your stomach and your brain and, and sometimes affecting your cravings, other times affecting your mood and so on and so forth. So food is also information. Right. All of it can actually, if you look at the complexity of the human person and the complexity of food, it can be overwhelming. <laughs> like, how could we ever figure all this out? And I have good news for you that you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. Um, because there's, there's a logic in nature. There's a beauty to God's design. And we can lean into that. So let's take a look at what we can discover about food and eating from the perspective of Scripture. So from the very beginning, God gave his people some instructions about food. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, after God created humanity, he said, God also said, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant on all the earth and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it to be your food. All the vegans are saying, Aha, God told them just to eat plants. It's true, but... 
after the flood, Genesis chapter 9, God updated him. He says, any living creature that moves about shall be yours to eat. I give them all to you as I did the green plants. Only meat with its lifeblood still in it you shall not eat. Indeed, for your own lifeblood I will demand an accounting. From every animal I will demand it, and from a human being, each one for the blood of another. I will demand an accounting for human life. So what's this deal with blood in here? Well, the the ancient Jewish people believed that the blood was the life force of the person. They didn't actually have the same notion of soul that we had. This uh, This was... brought in later by Greek philosophy primarily in other sources. So so they had a, a primarily physical understanding of the world and your blood was your life. So there was this concept that the life force was God's, not ours. So if you look at carefully at the Jewish temple rituals, so much of it had to do with sprinkling of blood or the pouring of blood or what they did with the blood after an animal was sacrificed. And the idea was you're offering the life force back to God. It belongs to God, not to us. So they didn't consume the blood of animals. Uh, later on, the Jews get these purity laws. So in the book of, uh, when, when they're given the law, they're given this intricate, complex grouping of laws on what they should eat and what they shouldn't eat and how they should eat and how they should wash before they eat. But this isn't uh, our current situation. So if you fast forward to when Jesus comes, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, our Lord says, It is not what enters one's mouth that defiles that person, but what comes out of the mouth is what defiles one. So the Jewish people had this notion where if they ate something unclean, or they didn't richly purify themselves before they ate, they would become richly impure or unclean. And what that meant was that they weren't able to approach the God approach God to offer sacrifice, to offer worship until they ritually purified themselves, until they went through certain uh, procedures and rituals to cleanse themselves or certain periods of time to cleanse themselves. Um, So Jesus is saying, it's not what you eat, it's not what enters your mouth that defiles, but it's what comes out that defiles. Uh, And then later on, Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He goes on and talks about how these animals have plenty to eat and plenty to drink, and they don't have to worry about it. So there has to be, um, I think, a trust in the Lord in all of this. I think one of the biggest... um, One of the biggest struggles people have around eating is thinking about it too much. We're worrying about it too much, right? You could you can go on one extreme and not worry about it at all and just go with the flow and eat whatever looks good. And that's that's a really uh, good recipe to be healthy until you're about 30 years old and then to watch your health deteriorate slowly over the next five to 40 years. Um, or the other extreme is I'm going to worry about it so much and it's got to be perfect or else I'm going to get all these diseases and everything's going to go terrible and I can't eat a single bit of non-organic perfect food or I have to eat all plants or all animals or whatever and just go crazy worrying about it. That's impossible too, right? The best answers science has now are, are provisional. We don't know exactly what we should eat. We don't. We don't. No, no scientist can tell you any... Anyone who claims that they know the perfect human diet, it's probably a good sign you shouldn't listen to them. Um, So so don't worry so much about it, right? What we're we're called to do is to try to do well, right? Try to eat things that are are healthful. Um, But on the other hand, realizing that it's never going to be perfect. So the early Christians approached this idea of the Jewish purity laws and asked the question, what should we eat? Should we follow all these purity laws? Here's a vision that God gave to St. Peter in Acts chapter 10. It says, The next day, while they were on their way and nearing the city, Peter went up to the roof terrace to pray at about noontime. He was hungry and wished to eat. And while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something resembling a large sheet coming down, lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all the earth's four-legged animals and reptiles and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, 
Get up, Peter. Slaughter and eat. But Peter said, Certainly not, sir, for never have I eaten anything profane and unclean. The voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has made clean, you are not to call profane. This happened three times, and then the object was taken up into the sky. All right, so, so Peter goes up. He's hungry. It's around noontime. You've probably felt that feeling like it's about lunchtime and your stomach's letting you know. I'm getting a little bit of that right now, actually. Um, and Peter goes into this trance and he sees these animals come down. You know, some of these animals, for example, pigs, Jewish people wouldn't eat. It would make them unclean. Um, and, and God tells them to slaughter and eat. And Peter's response is, no, like certainly not. I'm not going to become profane. These, these foods will make me unclean. And God's response was, what God has made clean, you are not to call profane. Right? So God is, is changing something, doing a new work here. There's something about this new season of grace that transcends the old law. And then later on, the, the apostles actually get together because most of the early Christians are Jewish converts. And then the question is, as the Holy Spirit is being received by people who aren't Christian— or people who aren't uh, who aren't Jewish, it's obvious that God is calling the Gentiles into Christianity too. So the question was, how much of the Jewish law do these Gentiles need to follow? And sometimes this is called the Council of Jerusalem. But here is where the apostles land. It said, It is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us not to place on you any burden beyond these necessities, namely to abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meats of strangled animals, and from unlawful marriage. If you keep free of these, you will be doing what is right. So they they simplified the Jewish law. Of course, the the Ten Commandments don't go away. The Ten Commandments are a reflection of the natural law. Um, So the Ten Commandments are there because, uh, because it's just the order of reality those 10 things. But on the other hand, these are the, the tenets from the Jewish purity laws that are kept, the, the Jewish holiness code. So to abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from the strangling of animals, almost like, uh, you know, get your food from ethical sources, <laughs> uh, get your food from animals that are treated well, and then to abstain from unlawful marriage. So also in their relationships with one another. So it's clear from the scripture that God's inviting us to eat everything, right? To eat what our ancestors ate, uh, that, that all of the, the plants that are edible to us and the animals that are edible to us, as long as they're raised properly in an ethical way, right? Then we should eat those things. Um, and, and this is, like I said, is one of the great strengths of being human is the diversity of the human diet. There's actually some interesting things that came out of various church councils from history about food. So I want to share a couple of these church councils. The first from the Council of Florence, which was an ecumenical council in the 8th century, said, Thus it declares that the nature of no food which society admits is to be condemned, and no distinction is to be made by anyone at all, whether man or woman, between animals and by whatever kind of death they meet their end. Although for the health of body, for the exercise of virtue, for regular and ecclesiastical disciplines, many things not denied should be given up. According to the apostle, all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. So what this council is saying is that that we shouldn't condemn any particular kind of food or or tell people they shouldn't eat it, but for certain purposes at certain times for, for discipline, we should choose to give up certain things for the sake of health and holiness. Uh, so also a, a local council, one of the councils of Toledo, said, if anyone says or believes that the flesh of birds or of animals, which has been given for food, not only ought to be abstained from for the chastising of the body, but also ought to be abhorred, let him be anathema. <laughs> a pretty strong language. I, I believe that this council is actually speaking in, in the context of certain rigoristic heresies where people um, were, were overly disciplined in the body 
And so what they were saying is you shouldn't eat any flesh, any animal, because it's, it's uh, going to arouse these unlawful passions in you or something like that. Um, and it could have also been uh, remnants of people still trying to impose Jewish purity laws on people. I, I'm not 100% sure on the exact history of the declaration. Um, but what they're saying is people shouldn't abhor the eating of flesh. Not that everyone has to eat animals if they don't want to, but we shouldn't impose it as a rule on other people. It should give um, some people who are more extreme about their dietary approach or the way that they try to evangelize other people into their dietary approach a little bit of pause. To be anathema is to be excommunicated. All right, so from the the, the perspective of... Um, of lifestyle then, from the perspective of philosophy to build on revelation, we might talk about the idea of virtue. Paragraph 1809 of the Catechism says, temperance is the mortal virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. It ensures the will's mastery over instincts and keeps desires within limits of what is honorable. The temperate person directs the sensitive appetites toward what is good and maintains a healthy discretion. Uh, so this idea of temperance, this natural virtue or mortal virtue, as it says, we've talked to it about it in previous episodes as moderating our, our concupiscible passions, our passions, our attractions and repulsions toward things that are attractive or, or things that are, are not good for us. So temperance moderates our, our passions toward things that are attractive. So it ensures the will's mastery over our instincts. So our, our instincts are formed by a whole complex of causes, whether it be the, the history of adaptation of the human body or our own personal history, right, our own story. Um, and, and as a result, now we have what I like to call the buffet effect. When you approach a buffet, there are certain foods on the buffet you're attracted to and other ones you're repulsed by, and that determines what you pick up and put on your plate to eat. All right, so this... This whole complex of attractions and repulsions. So temperance moderates that. So to be intemperate toward food um, would be something like this. At the end of that buffet is always a soft serve ice cream machine. And the glorious quality of ice cream is as you eat it, it melts. So regardless of how much you ate, even if you had 14 plates of food, you can still eat ice cream. It doesn't take up any space. It just melts and fills in the cracks. <laughs> So, so that's what happens is you, you eat all the food and you still want that ice cream <laughs> uh, and, and you can eat it. But the question is, is that good for you? Or is that maybe the absolute worst thing you could possibly put into your body, both from a natural and a supernatural perspective at that point? And I think it is. Um, so, so the virtue of temperance helps us to control these passions, right? The sense appetite the passions that go along with our internal and external senses. Later on the Catechism, paragraph 2288 says, Life and physical health are precious gifts entrusted to us by God. We must take reasonable care of them, taking into account the needs of others and the common good. Right. So we can't just discard the health of the body. Right? The, the goal isn't to just be this free-range spirit uh, with with getting rid of this mortal coil, this flesh that we have. No, we're called to have a redemption of our body. We're called to experience a transformation of our passions and desires to be in accord, to be in harmony with God's design. To experience That's what virtue is. It's the redemption of our passions that we're actually attracted to what is good for us. But food also has a lot to do with the common good. Like I mentioned before, there's there's... Uh, people in the world that are starving, a lot of people today for political reasons, but even more than that, we, we need to be involved in providing for the needs of others. Food is also a social justice issue. And the question is, what are we called to eat and, and what's just to eat? And how much should we then share with others? For example, I think there's a huge issue in our world today of food waste. We waste a ton of food, whether it be the way that supermarkets or restaurants handle it to the way we handle it at food. And there's a huge injustice to wasting food, both to the environment and to people who go without. So it's also an issue of the common good. And finally, paragraph 2290 of the Catechism, the virtue of temperance disposes us to avoid every kind of excess. 
the abuse of food, alcohol, tobacco, or medicine, those incur grave guilt who, by drunkenness or love of speed, endanger their own or other safety on the road, at sea, or in the air. So here's talking about drunkenness, but uh, it's actually a, a grave sin to endanger the health of our body by eating, right? So there's, there's a, a vice called gluttony, a sin called gluttony, and this is eating, and, and it could manifest in multiple different ways. It could be excessive eating. Uh, one of the, the different kinds of gluttony is actually being overly picky about your food. So, so demanding like excessively high quality of food or, or just particular kinds of food, but kind of being persnickety about what you're going to eat or overly picky about what you're eating. That's a manifestation of gluttony. And we don't often think of that. So any of these, um, these kind of aberrations or, or, or unnatural inclinations toward food is this vice of gluttony. And this needs to be moderated by temperance, the virtue of temperance. All right, let's lay in the plane and talk some about how we should eat and what we should eat. First, like I said, if you look at the human body, it's clear that our ancestors ate a lot of different stuff. So I would propose we need a lot of diversity in our diet. Some people propose accomplishing this by having different colors. So you like every meal, you try to eat five or six or seven different colors. Um, a lot of modern processed food is white in yellow and orange. You can kind of get this plate of like mushy white, yellow and orange stuff on your plate. Um, but, but things in nature are, are either green, right? That, that, that photosynthesis, that green color or, or different seeds or, or roots have all kinds of different colors. Meat, meat even has a variety of shades of red and brown to it. Uh, so we need a lot more diversity in our diet. Our, our ancestors ate animals nose to tail, skin, bone, connective tissue, all the organs, all the muscle meat, they ate it all, right? It was either survive or die, and they chose survival. And, and our body has come to expect nutrients from some of these things, and we might not be eating them, right? We, we supplement uh, the micronutrients that we have by taking things like multivitamins and other supplements, but it's possible to eat those nutrients too. And there's evidence that uh, in, in the form of of animal products, a lot of these micronutrients are more bioavailable or in, in a state that our body can more easily absorb them and use them. Uh, most nutrients from plant foods, there needs to be a conversion process that happens in the body to make it what the body needs. Uh, and you might notice, uh, like for example, on the back of nutrient labels, sometimes there's like numbers after the vitamins, like vitamin D2 or vitamin D3 would be an example. Well, the D2 is the plant form of D, and our body needs to convert that into what how it can be used, where the D3 is closer to what the body actually would use. It's the, what you might call it the animal form of it. Um, now, I'm no uh, nutritionist or expert in all of this, but diversity in our diet is a good idea. And I would also say uh, one of the things that we might be tempted to in our modern food environment is an excessively restrictive diet. So you might be tempted by some food guru that tells you everyone has to be vegan or everyone has to be carnivore or paleo or something, and then ad adopt a super restrictive diet and, and not really have a huge reason to do that. Uh, if you want to restrict things in your diet, I would propose to you to restrict um, a lot of these hyper-processed contemporary foods, which are just reconfigurations of wheat, soy, and corn. Like, cut all that stuff out. You might have heard people tell you, say to, like, shop the outside of the grocery store. Like, just stick to the veggies, the meat, the dairy, the frozen stuff, and then skip all the stuff in the middle or just pick up some spices, um, you know, to flavor your food. And it's actually a really good suggestion. Uh, one of the things that we should be careful of is to limit hyper palatable foods. Something that's hyper palatable, hyper is above, our palate is what we taste, what we desire to eat. So there are scientists that in labs, they do experiments and they identify the exact bliss point of combinations of sugar, salt, fat. And by Identifying this bliss point, they know that they'll sell more food. We, we taste it, and it creates this super abundant, hyper palatable experience that hijacks our brain and hijacks 
all of the, the systems in the body which signal satiety, meaning the signaling of when you should stop eating, and then also creates an exaggerated craving for food in us, and we can't stop eating it. These foods are also typically very soft and mushy. So processed down into something that we basically have to put no effort into eating and then uh, sets our brain on fire and we can't stop eating it. So I think as much as possible, we should try to limit these hyper palatable foods. And it's actually, um, I think, a charity to ourselves to do this. It's charity. It's to love ourselves, to, to not put our body in contact with this. It's essentially food porn. I mean, this is, this is what it is. It, 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 we, we take it into ourselves. It's nutrient empty, meaning it might be fortified with a few things that we need, but you get like 2% of some nutrient that you need in your body. And then at the same time, you're getting all these empty calories. Um, and then you wonder why you can't stop eating or you're gaining weight. Um, so eat from, from nature, eat from nature, skip the stuff with labels Cook things from the basic ingredients. Now, now there are certainly some things that that come packaged that aren't bad for you. Like it might be minimally processed, like maybe just frozen and maintaining freshness, or maybe, um, like I said, a seasoning or something like that that's ground up. But as much as possible, try to eat the food in its natural state. And the reason for that is, remember, we co-evolved or co-adapted in the midst of food uh, that came at us from nature. So there's so much in this that's beyond what we can understand. And then that's also communicating something to your body. You know, our ancestors were, would, would have been eating some, uh, for the most part, seasonally. While there are areas of the world where there isn't a lot of seasonality, there would, would still be different, um, whether it be the migration of animals or different plants that were in season, there would have been this diversity to the human diet. And along with that, the human body came to um, came to react in certain ways as a result of it. Like I used to um, to run a kitchen for a Boy Scout camp. We could actually predict the food budget based on the temperature of the week. We were out and people were staying in, in tents all week. We knew that if it was colder out, all of the all of the scouts would eat more, and if it was warmer out, all of the scouts would eat less. Uh, there's all these signals from the natural environment that tell our body what to do. A lot of people, I think, experience in the fall a certain amount of weight gain, right? There's, there's these natural signals our body experiences, and what it is is it's an adaptation to survive the winter. And like I said, not everywhere in the world, but a lot of the world has this seasonality. And, and lo and behold, what would come in in nature during the fall would be many very carbohydrate-rich foods, whether it be fruit or roots or, or different things from the harvest, right? The fall is the harvest time. So there would be this abundant of dietary carbohydrate. And so the body is primed. Then as a result of that, you, you eat the sugar. It makes glucose in the blood. Your body makes insulin and pushes the glucose into your cells. Right? You could think of the body kind of like a hybrid vehicle. A hybrid car has a, has a, a battery of electricity and then also a fuel tank. Our fat storage is really kind of like that fuel tank for long-term storage. The, um, and then we also have sort of a, a short-term energy supply of, um, of um, glucose in our muscle and around our liver, and then also just the, the, um, what we've eaten recently. Um, so when your body runs out of nutrients from the short-term supply, then your body accesses the long-term storage in your body fat. Uh, but in order to do that, so your body creates fat by pushing the insulin, pushing the, the, the glucose into the cells, or, or also the, you can get fat by eating fat too, by pushing the, uh, the fat substrate in the cells. And then once the insulin is low, then your body can go through a process called lipolysis where the body fat is used for energy. But our, our modern food environment is essentially uh, eternal fall. <laughs> we always have a, an abundance of dietary carbohydrate available to us in a, a temperature-controlled environment, you know, where an air conditioner keeps us comfortably at 70 or 65 degrees or something. <laughs> and, and then uh, people can live a life where they never stop eating, right? So their insulin is always high, so then lipolysis can never happen. 
Um, and, and people get in this cycle where like every year they gain a couple pounds until they're well, 40, 50 pounds overweight. And this is what's happening is we live in the land of eternal fall. So all of the signals we're giving to our body is telling it, put on weight, put on weight, put on weight. Um, all that is to say that we should eat uh, more diversity, more seasonally, more locally, um, natural foods as much as possible. So how do we know we're eating the right stuff? There are some proxies for health, and I would I would propose to you that the scale isn't necessarily the best proxy for health. Um, so in, part of my story was getting on the scale every day and tracking my weight loss, which is great when you're losing weight. But then when I stopped losing weight and my weight started doing the natural fluctuation that humans do, um, I noticed that the number on the scale started to affect my prayer and the rest of my mood the rest of the day. If I would gain a couple pounds, I would feel worse. If I would lose, I would feel good. And, and I wanted to get off this emotional roller coaster, so I stopped weighing myself. And I weigh myself like every month or two now. And, and, and I notice, well, I'm always kind of within the same amount, which is great. So some other proxies you might try if the scale is a trigger for you uh, would be a waist to height ratio or a waist to hip ratio. So the measurement of your waist to the measurement of your height uh, one of the, the things that scientists have discovered is that the fat around your organs underneath your muscle is actually a lot more dangerous to your health than the fat under your skin. Uh, so measuring your waist compared to your height gives you a sense of that fat being carried in your, your torso and your trunk as compared to your height or compared to your hips. So that gives you uh, a better sense. So some people say a two to one. So like if I'm six feet tall, that means I'm 72 inches high, so half of that would be 36 inches. So measured at the widest place around my waist, an ideal place to be would be 36 inches or less. And then with the hips, that the hips are bigger than the waist. So let's say my waist is 36 inches and my hips measure 38 inches. Well, then that's probably a pretty good place to be. The other proxies you might consider are things like dental health. Now, it doesn't make sense that uh, we would have these teeth that would go rotten and fall out. <laughs> so chances are whatever our ancestors were eating, their their teeth weren't falling out before they needed to stop eating. Um, their, their teeth, uh, from the fossil records we can find, their teeth actually wore out because their food was so rough, right? They were having to chew a lot. But then there was also this effect of having rougher food or coarser food that it would also clean their teeth. It would knock the chunks off. They wouldn't have the same amount. So um, interestingly enough, um, People living these ancestral lifestyles are found to not have all of the same tooth troubles or, or not as commonly the same tooth troubles that we do in our culture. And then skin health. You can tell by the skin. Remember that the digestive tract and the skin are one continuous surface. So a lot of times uh, issues on the inside of the body will start to manifest in the areas where food either goes in or comes out. For example, if I start eating uh, some sugar or processed food, I start to notice acne around my mouth and around my nose first. Interestingly enough, right outside of this cavity, a lot of people will ex uh, experience issues in their bowels or issues in their, um, in their colon and different things. Well, these are, are clues, right? These are clues that something's happening inside. Whatever's happening here and here and here is probably also happening in here. So these are different clues for health. What does all of this mean uh, for our asceticism? What are some, some ideas? How can we apply this to our life? I would propose eating healthful foods that you're not accustomed to. Right, So a lot of people in our culture can't stand foods like organs or other vegetables that they are not accustomed to or have a taste for. These, these are super healthy, nutrient-rich foods that are good for us, that our ancestors ate and, and were a cornerstone of their diet. Watch... Um, different travel food videos of people in the third world. And what you find is these people are eating the whole animal. You'll see them eating brain and liver and spleen and heart and tendons and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, so try some of that stuff. You're probably going to think it's gross, but it will be good for your body. Another ascetical idea, uh, don't eat anything with a nutrition facts label on it for a week or maybe for all of Lent. Take Lent off of packaged food, right? So cook everything from scratch, from the basic ingredients, or eat it raw. Um, eat everything from 
its most basic things. And that that's great because it takes extra time, but there's a, a greater connection and a different emotional relationship with your food when you cook it and when you prepare it and when you understand it and know what goes into it. Uh, and that changes our relationship to what we eat. Another idea, try to start growing your own food. This is something I'm moving toward. So growing your own food changes your relationship to it also, right? Understanding the natural process, uh, what goes into making it happen. You start to appreciate uh, what it is and I think become less inclined to waste it. Try to go an entire Lent or an entire, entire month with no food waste, meaning that you're planning out what you eat and what you buy and you're being careful and you don't waste a single ounce of food the whole month. Another thing you might try are um, are getting rid of any caloric beverage. <laughs> so things like pop other drinks with calories, it's not really something our body understands very well. You know, think of it in nature, like animals eat milk as a baby, and then our, our bodies are, are on various degrees adapted to, to take and handle dairy uh, well or not well, depending on who you are. But otherwise, what caloric drinks are there in nature that our ancestors would have encountered? You know, they might have encountered honey and mixed that in with stuff or, or maybe mixed fruit and vegetables, but they drink water, right? So take caloric beverages out of your diet. Um, and these, these calories that we drink are oftentimes the most harmful to our body and to our wellness. Well, we've just scratched the surface about eating, but I hope this episode has given you some ideas to think about. Dig into the show notes. I have, I'm, I have a lot of links there, studies, different information that you can find on this topic. Like I said, I'm no expert, and this is something that's been important for my journey, though. I'm preparing a whole course on food from a Catholic perspective. Uh, so I hope you look forward to that and realize that this is just a primer. So God bless everyone and eat up. This show and all media on Awaken Catholic is made possible by the Awaken Nation and the Hollow app. The Awaken Nation is a community of people like you who support all things Awaken for as cheap as a cup of coffee a week and get access to exclusive content. Learn more by visiting awakencatholic.org slash donate. Hollow is the only audio guided Catholic prayer app focused on contemplative prayer and traditional Catholic meditation such as Lexio Divina, Daily Examine, and the Rosary. We here at Awaken all use Hollow every day and love it. To learn more or give it a try, visit hollow.app slash awaken.